I remember last session, or I guess it was on Monday, one of you asked me, why would you go with a very large model, do the pre-training, if you are interested in a downstream task? Why don't you design a particular architecture or a specific architecture for that particular task? Why do you need these large models? And the answer was twofold. One of them was, uh, when you're writing a large model, the large model is capable of processing much more data and processing uh, unlabeled data, and then you can do transfer learning. And this way you can learn from the language in general, and then fine tune on a specific task and improve the performance. And the other objective was moving towards models that can perhaps in the future achieve human level intelligence. And language is a perfect platform to test whether the AI system that we're designing is actually as intelligent as we want it to be. It's a good platform to test it and communicate with it. But then if you don't want to live in the future and you want to live today, you want to design a product and you want to put it on your company's website and serve your customers, you have a particular task. Maybe your task is a question answering task and you want low latency or fast response rate. You're gonna have millions of users interacting with your service and you want them to get their results as fast as possible. And this is the idea of this deal, BERT. You start with a large model. It is pre-trained on a large corpus because it's a large corpus, that large model is not gonna overfit. So you're gonna keep learning and learning from a lot of data on its own. And then you're gonna distill that knowledge in a smaller model that you can actually put on your homepage or on your web page. Let's take a look at the picture. It was around 2019 and things have already changed a lot. You're going higher and higher exponentially in terms of your model size. We started with Elmo, then we covered GPT, GPT-1, it had 110 million parameters. Then we covered BERT large, which was a little bit larger. Then there was Transformer Elmo, then GPT came, GPT-2, it was 1,500 millions or million parameters. Then we had Microsoft, then you have Facebook, then you have NVIDIA, uh, coming up with larger and larger models and training them, which is a massive engineering effort on its own. We covered Roberta, we sometime covered Albert, we are gonna cover XLNet, and this Dilbert is here, it's 66. So it's much smaller, and it's gonna retain 97% of Bert's performance. And if you compare it to Elmo, Bert Base, and this Dilbert, on these downstream tasks, they are performing as good as, good as each other, especially Bert and the Stilbert are better than the other. And so far, so good. How do you do it? In the first part of the course, for those of you who took it, we spend quite a bit of time on distillation. You can use distillation to distill the knowledge in a large model, in a smaller model, or you can sometimes use distillation as a defense mechanism for perturbations to neural networks and adversarial attacks. So it's a framework that is known. It's not like this paper is coming up with the idea, but they're using it for distilling the knowledge of a BERT model in a smaller one. What is the framework? It's a quick summary of it. You have a compact model, let's call it student. In this case, it is gonna be distilled BERT. Maybe it has twice less depth, or maybe it is twice less in terms of the hidden dimension. You have a larger model, in our case, is BERT. What is the distillation loss? What are we trying to do? The teacher is going to look at a sentence and it's going to output some scores, some probabilities. And these probabilities, you can think of them per each uh, word that is being speeded out of the large model. Because we know BERT is going to take a sequence as input and it's going to output another sequence of vectors or probabilities. That's your TI. And then there is the log of the SI. SI is coming out of your student. So the student is the student is outputting a distribution. The teacher is outputting another distribution on the same data. And you want them to be as close as possible to each other. And you can take a look at the cross-entropy between two distributions and you try to match them. 
and cross entropy if the teacher is actually ground truth data what is going to come out of ground truth data are the true labels which are usually zeros and ones so it's going to be a one hot vector here of the correct class being a one the rest of them being zero then you're going to get your log likelihood back out of this distillation loss okay you can think of distillation loss as the teacher giving the student uh, soft uh, labels these are not hard one hot encoded labels these are soft labels so this is the probability estimate coming out of the teacher network probability estimates coming out of the student network i mean the teacher is trying to be nice to the student they are not going to give them one hot vectors because they don't have them and at the same time they don't want to give them the correct probabilities maybe one of the probabilities are we are too confident about it maybe one of these probabilities is too high and the rest of them are too low what the teacher is going to do is going to divide by a temperature and then it's going to smooth out these probabilities the ones that are really high they're going to go down a little bit the ones that are the mistakes and shouldn't happen the teacher is going to increase them a little bit if you set the temperature to be too high this is going to end up being zero exponential of zero is one these are going to be one over the summation of a bunch of ones and that's going to give you just one over the count of outputs or the number of classes in this case which is basically uniform distribution you don't want to set t too high you don't want to set t too low if you set it too low it's actually going to become one hot vectors what are you doing here with the temperature not only the student is learning from the correct outcomes from the high confident probabilities they are also going to learn from the mistakes of the teacher that's why you put the temperature there and you're going to use a temperature of i don't know maybe 10 or 100 you train the student the teacher is fixed is bird you are training the steel bird and at inference you're going to set the temperature back to the value that is normal we usually use t should be one and basically you don't have any temperature or the temperature of one was this framework clear knowledge distillation okay cool not only you do knowledge distillation so once you be you sit behind the computer this is the main idea that we came up with you sit behind the computer you code it and then you are not going to get 97 percent performance compared to BERT you're going to get a lower performance you are going to be unhappy with your idea you have two options give up your idea or try to modify something maybe modify your architecture modify your data or modify your last function what they're going to do here you are going to keep distillation so it is still a good idea to learn from BERT but it is also a good idea for the student to look at real data and real labels so it's the idea of not only learn from your teacher but also learn from the society from real data and then at the same time you can work with the cosine distance what is that you want the teacher and the student they are going to have some hidden state vectors so this is not your probabilities anymore but these are actually your z's you want the z's those hidden states to align so there is a question in the chat what is the relative performance of megatron lm compared to these other models is it much better uh, not really it is not much better it is much better when it comes to modeling the language but it's not much better when you compare it to or you apply it on downstream tasks and one could argue that these downstream tasks are much easier and using a language model a very large one on these tasks is not gonna reveal the performance that it can actually get out of a large language model okay so the performance is comparable that one is about uh, the engineering effort and the sheer fact that it can actually train such a huge model on thousands of gpus is an engineering feat okay? and that one is more future looking perspective you don't really care about these uh, mundane tasks you're looking in the future trying to come up with general ai or human level ai and we saw the same pattern when we were doing uh, 
text classification, some of them, some of our text classification tasks were not complex enough for deep learning. And we were not noticing the advantages of deep learning on those smaller tasks. It's the same pattern here. Maybe you need to rethink your, your downstream tasks. And actually people are doing that. But these are really good questions, okay? What is the architecture in the end? You are gonna reduce the number of layers by two, by a factor of two. If you're using BERT base, you have 12 blocks of transformers, you reduce that to six. If you are using BERT large, you're gonna use, reduce that by two as well. And at the same time, you don't want to wait for a long time for your training to actually converge. You can initialize because you know the parameters of your BERT. You can initialize the student with the teacher. So it's a faster way of transferring the knowledge from the teacher to the student, but their architectures are different. Some layers are absent from the student. So you're gonna initialize whatever that exists in the teacher and transfer it to the student. And these tasks are really, they, they, they actually made it easy for us. If you work with a framework like PyTorch or TensorFlow, these tasks are really easy to copy a model and paste it to another one. Copy the weights of one model, paste it to the other one. Okay, and in the end, how many parameters do you have? You have 66, the same number is here, so they match, and inference time is almost half. Any questions? Okay, cool.